Okay. Okay. Great. Well, I'm sorry. I, I didn't get the memo right away. There's a little bit tired today, but I'm really excited to be here with this in this session with you all. Uh, my name is Nicholas Paulus. I'm the president elected of the Web3 Consortium, and uh, you know we we missed you guys so much from our last SIGGRAPH boffs uh, that we had to do it again. And um, you know we have really constructive, I think. Uh, dialogues when we do get together. And so I wanted to thank you for, for attending and, and thank John Ouellette uh, from Versar for organizing this. And I won't get in your way. Uh, I know we have lots of fun stuff to talk about. So thanks everyone and, and welcome. Thank you. All right, so based on our agenda, Tamara, you wanna go first? Oh, sorry. Were you uh, talking about me? So, yeah. I, uh, I, oh, hold on. Sure. I think we agreed Peter was going first. Peter. Yes, you that's what I thought. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. Let me share my screen again. You can. Everyone can see that. Okay. Yeah, Peter looks great. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, hello there. Uh, I'm Peter Gagliardi. I'm a software developer at Cesium. I'm on the 3D Tiles team uh, where we're building the next generation of 3D Tiles. Uh, and you know, today I'm happy to be here at uh, Web3D to uh, talk about, you know, to talk about 3D Tiles Next, our new draft extensions for 3D Tiles, uh, which are now open for community feedback in GitHub. Um, so 3D Tiles and Web3D actually uh, go have quite a bit of a history. Uh, you know, so our CEO Patrick Cozy, uh, he's presented at Web3D a few times in the past. Uh, so like once in 2014, uh, you know, just a little bit before 3D Tiles was created in 2015 and then uh, soon afterwards in 2016. Uh, you know, 3D Tiles has since you know, uh, in recent years become, uh, you know, an OGC community standard. Like it's, I mean, it's always been an open source specification and, you know, it's, you know, uh, become a lot more prevalent over the years. It's a big part of everything we do here at Cesium. And uh, now, as of like this week, like literally yesterday, uh, we are announcing three tiles next. Our uh, you know these again, uh, we're making extensions for three tiles. Uh, they're all open specifications. They're all available for community feedback. And at the end of the presentation, I'll I'll give some information about how you can get involved with that. Uh, so I guess uh, I guess is there a good way to give like a, a show of hands of like you know how um, who's familiar with three D tiles already? I guess I'm not familiar with the Zoom controls for that, but you know. Uh, okay, I don't. I don't know if there's any way to do a show of hands. <laughs> um, anyway. Well, I'll, in any case, I'll give give a quick overview of three tiles for you know whether you've seen it before or, or just and need a refresher or if it's completely new to you. Uh, you know, so three tiles. It's uh, open standard for streaming large, uh, massive uh, geospatial data sets. Everything from, like, you know, everything from terrain, photogrammetry, point clouds, uh, you know, three D models of buildings, etc. Uh, you know, and even though that this data comes in in many different formats, we make one big run uh, format optimized for runtime streaming. Great for visualization and analysis. And some of the cool things that make it work, uh, you know, is, is it's very flexible. You can represent a lot of different spatial data structures, everything from quad trees, octa trees, KD trees, uh, you know, however you want to define a bounding volume hierarchy. You know, all our, you know, tiles, you know, the, the tile formats are all designed to be runtime ready, uh, you know, and like being able to just upload it to the GPU and display it. And GLTF is a big part of that. That's, an, uh, you know, that, Open standard from Kronos, and that uh, you know that provides us like a 3D mesh format that you know that's op you know optimized for streaming. And you know one of the cool parts of that is uh, you know, and then on top of that we want to like have metadata to be able to label you know say like hey this group of uh, vertices we can identify this as a building, and what's more you can add metadata properties to be able to say like hey here's the height of the building, here's the occupancy occupancy, and so forth. You know, so that's three tiles as it, you know, very quick overview of three tiles as it is today, uh, you know, but what does the future look like? And, you know, the, it, we want to, we're building, uh, you know, it so that we can make, you know, support like increasingly massive data structures, uh, data sets, 
you know, and we want to have like this, these metadata properties, we want to just make it a much richer environment, you know, make use of like uh, AI classification and, and you know, be able to store that efficiently in three tiles. So that brings us to three tiles next are uh, you know, these new draft extensions for three tiles. And we have you know, a few big goals for that. So one of them is just to make the integration with GLTF cleaner. Uh, I mean, again, GLTF has always been a big part of three tiles, but we just wanna uh, you know, just streamline that a little bit more. Uh, we want, again, uh, be able to include meaningful information. So we wanna have metadata and just make that more robust, more efficient. And then implicit tiling, uh, we want to optimize, uh, you know, cases for massive simulations and analytics. You know, uh, quad trees and octrees are pretty common, so we want to, you know, we already found some ways to optimize that a bit. So to the first point, uh, integration with GLTF. So we have a format, uh, sorry, extension uh, called Three Tiles to Content GLTF, uh, and the extension, it, you know, works pretty simply. All it just allows you to say, like, hey, the the content of a single tile in a tile set. Uh, you want, uh, you can basically just say point to a GLTF file now and it, it'll just directly work. And the point of this is just kind of simplify things. Like we had uh, formats like the uh, batch three model, i3dm, uh, instance three model points and whatnot. And a lot of them, they're essentially wrappers around GLTF. You know, the, you know, it's like, for example, b3dm, it's a GLTF with a small binary header and a batch table, which gives you some like metadata properties, uh, you know, at the vertex level. And now we're trying to like re-express that in a simpler way. So it's just going to be a GLTF with now it has an extension. We, this new ext mesh features extension is is our metadata extension for GLTF. And uh, you know, so that just kind of keeps it a lot simpler. So now you can make use of other you know existing GLTF tools. And the cool thing, and like all the other formats are pretty similar. And even point clouds can now be represented in GLTF uh, since GLTF does support point primitives. And then, you know, with ext mesh features, you can store all the other properties. Uh, and the, you know, cool thing with using, uh, using GLTF in everything we do is the, you know, is like there's a lot of cool tooling and extensions out nowadays. You know, for, uh, you know, for example, some of the uh, recent extensions are like, you know, compression. There's KTX2 for texture compression, mesh out for mesh compression, GPU instancing, which is one, uh, uh, which is a detail of how, like, how instance three model format, how that can be converted to GLTF. And then, uh, you know, Kronos has PBR next, you know, so there's lots of new PBR materials for, you know, better looking models, you know, specular, clear code, sheen, and so forth. You know, certainly those can be leveraged by three tiles now. Uh, so the second big point is metadata, you know, so if you want to make a virtual representation of the real world, you know, uh, so I mean, of course, one big part of it is, you know, getting good quality data, getting nice photogrammetry and so and so forth. Uh, but it's even more valuable if you can actually uh, imbue that with, you know, information like, you know, meaningful information about what is what is this data, you know, so be able to say that, hey, you know, this scene of a building like, you know, here's here's a window and here's a door and even further, you know, properties about them. to so be able to say that like, hey, this wall is made of concrete, this window is made of glass. So it's like a transparent material, um, you know, and some of those, uh, you know, this classification uh, is, you know, can be, you know, come from say like AI and machine learning to, you know, be able to divide up a model into different classifications. So, you know, how do we make this into, uh, you know, a, a format? So, uh, you know, one of the things is we want to just, I mean, we, you know, again, with the batch table, we had some amount of metadata capabilities, but we just want to like make this more robust. So one of the things is we want to like expand it to more levels of detail. So the uh, levels of granularity, excuse me. The, you know, so we want to go both finer green. So in the GLTF extension, not only do we have vertex metadata that, you know, which is essentially what we had before with batch tables, uh, but now we even want to have like texture metadata as well and instance metadata. And then on the flip side, uh, we also want coarser metadata to, you know, just, just to, you know, just to make it more flexible. So like, for, uh, for example, if you, you might want to just have some information about the tile set itself, you know, as, as far as like, you know, who's the all, like what's the attribution for it and so, so forth. Uh, tile metadata might be used for like, you know, like we, fi we find it useful for like, you know, storing performance information, you know, so that that can kind of optimize uh, things at runtime. And, you know, plenty of other things you can do with that. 
And uh, the de design is designed to be decoupled a bit, you know, so you have like the type system, you know, which is kind of describing what, uh, what is the metadata, like what, what, what metadata properties are, exist, what types are they, are they, you know, is it a vector, is it a, a string, is it an integer property? Uh, you know, and you can define whole schemas like that. There's the encodings, which is how do you store things? You know, how do you actually store this metadata? Do you store it in binary, which is great for like inside of a GLTF, you want like, you know, very high frequency, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of data, so you want to store it efficiently in binary. Uh, similarly with textures, we want to store that in like, you know, some sort of image file. And then uh, for coarse metadata, like tiles that you only have one tile set, so JSON is fine. And then semantics is another layer on top of that. Uh, you know, so for example, like, you know, single uh, domain, so like, you know, something like, like uh, AEC or, or something, that, you know, you can, uh, an industry can come up with a set of semantics, you know, so set of, like a common schema, uh, you know, that everyone can share that, you know, that, um, you know, so, hey, we're all going to support these properties that are meaningful to our industry. So now if I make a data set here, I can you know, pass it to your application and it'll work. And, you know, so it's, it's designed in a way that can be used interoperably. Uh, another thing I just wanted to highlight is the texture metadata, the, uh, which, which is a new feature that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, you know, Cause it, it allows you to do much higher frequency metadata. So, uh, and there's kind of two different flavors of it. There's property textures, which lets you, you know, for data that varies from point to point, you know, like, for example, think of like a heat map on a surface where every texel is going to be a different value. You can store properties like that. And then, but then for say like a photogrammetry use case where you're, um, you want, you want to classify things, uh, feature ID textures are great for that, where you're, or instead of storing the value, you're just storing which, which feature is, is this texel belong to, you know, so for example, is this, you know, maybe a zero represents a wall and a one represents the roof. And, uh, and then from there, you can look that up in the table of like, okay, the, roof, the wall has these properties, the roof has these properties. And uh, just to show this, I have a live demo for you of, you know, example of feature ID textures. Uh, you know, so this data set uh, provided by Airmetrics, you know, it's a street letter, street level photogrammetry um, data set at a sub -center centimeter uh, accuracy of the ferry building or well, part of it uh, from uh, in San Francisco. Now, I haven't personally been to San Francisco, but I've heard this is a very well-known building. So, um, and to show like the classification, like I, I showed you before. So now I can go in and like, I can hover over say like the windows and like, you know, I can see like, okay, this is ID zero, walls ID two and so forth. And like the clock is something else. And one of the key benefits of that is uh, it lets you do a lot of custom style, sty like much more uh, sophisticated styling and whatnot. So for example, I wrote a shader here that uh, we, you know, you can basically say like, hey, the windows, I wanna make them transparent while keeping everything else the same. And you can go further, like, you know, since, uh, you know, this, this is in our uh, open source CZMJS impl experimental implementation of this, uh, you know, and, and since we use GLTF, we use PBR materials, uh, you know, so I'm able to like kind of play around with it to be able to say like, hey, for each classification, use a different material. You know, I can, for example, make the clock extra shiny in metal. And I can make, well, even while making the windows transparent and so forth. And you can do like interactivity as well. So I can basically say like, I'm going to click a feature and highlight everything in the feature. And, you know, I was kind of going for like the Midas golden touch, you know, to make it all shiny, whatever you select. You know, uh, you know, so there's plenty of cool use cases that uh, come out of this. And then uh, the uh, another big point is implicit tiling, uh, you know, for making big scalable uh, simulations and whatnot. So it comes from the observation that like, you know, quad trees and octrees are, you know, pretty common uh, spatial data structures, you know, and, and they have a nice regular structure. So you don't have to store every little bounding volume uh, you know, it's kind of redundant. All you need to know is, okay, here's the main bounding volume and that it divides nice and evenly, uh, you know, in four or for an octree eight uh, smaller parts. And uh, and then all you need to do is being able to like label each tile. You know, so we use a like level of detail and then X, Y and for octree Z coordinates. And then all you need to do is for each tile, you just need a single bit that just says, hey, is there data here? store one, if it's, if there's no data here, store zero. 
So A, that makes it more compact, but the real benefit is that is it provides random access because now every tile is labeled uh, you know, by these coordinates. And this can accelerate certain types of queries. You know, so for example, if you're trying to do a simulation and you do need to do a lot of nearest neighbor queries, now instead of having to traverse the whole tree, uh, you can you can basically say like, hey, I know I'm in like my the coordinates I'm, I'm concerned about are here, so I can just like uh, select out a region around that and then like look at just those tiles. You know, so and there's plenty of other algorithms and, and stuff that this this can help with, and um, so. Then another extension that, uh, that pairs very well with this is S2 bounding volumes. S2 is a different tiling uh, scheme for, you know, that, that's great for worldwide tile sets, data sets, um, that, um, you know, with the goal of, you know, reducing distortion, especially at the poles, because one thing with a lot of, um, you know, cylindrical projections, say, of the earth is like, you know, you're, you, anytime you try to make the earth flat, you're going to introduce distortion. And usually that shows up at the poles. But sometimes you do want to map the poles, uh, you know. So this kind of evens it out. And just to, and to show you that, I have another demo here. The um, you know uh, this whole base globe. So this data set is provided by Maxr, and again, the big deal is trying to make the poles actually look decent. Uh, you know, so if I turn on the bounding volumes, you can kind of see what's going on here. So uh, S2, the way it kind of works is instead of using like a cylinder or cone for projection, uh, it's basically using a cube, and you know, so and then projecting that onto the, the sphere, uh, projecting that onto the shape of the Earth to to make like a, a nice evenly divided projection, uh, you know, and that provides like equal area tiles. But the key thing is it's kind of, you know, instead of having all the distortion in one place, it's kind of spreading it out over the entire globe. So no place is super distorted. Uh, so that makes it great for the poles. And, it, um, you know, and just each tile is, is you know, pretty uniform in area. Uh, and the other thing is, even though that like the, the tiles might look a little bit weird, they do divide nice and evenly. So, and so this is why it pairs very well with implicit tiling, which is all quad tree, not tree based. Uh, you know, and, and you can see like, as I, divide, you know, as I zoom in, like each one subdivides into four. Uh, and just a couple other things about this, this particular data set. Uh, the, uh, I do have a feature ID, this does come with feature ID, this one does come with feature ID texture. So I, you know, you can label like the, like this is like land cover classification. So you can say like, hey, here's water, here's vegetation and grassland and so forth. And of course, you can style with that. You know, I can like just style the water, for example. Uh, and then just another uh, another thing about implicit tiling, just to kind of compare it with uh, you know regular three D tiles, which uh, we sometimes call uh, explicit tiling, and because uh, they both have their place. You know, explicit tiling again is very flexible, and that you know and that's you know still can be very useful, you know, and uh, where you're, but you know, and you do that by listing each bounding volume and divide space how how you you want to or how how it's useful to your application. Uh, meanwhile, implicit tiling, uh, you know, again, it's quad tree not tree, and it's a lot more compact of a format, which is uh, you know, so you just declare one region, and then one one bounding volume, and then the you just have template URI patterns for like all the contents and everything. Remember, I'm, you know, you use level X, X, Y, and sometimes Z coordinates to uh, select things. And then I remember I said like there was a, you know, the, you just need like a bunch of bits to kind of say which tiles exist or not. And uh, those are stored in what, what we call subtree files. And uh, you know, those, those can also be found you know, by similar manner. So it's nice and compact. So what's, what's the feature look like for 3D tiles next? So again, we're you know opening things up for feedback in GitHub, uh, you know, and as as we get that uh, feedback, we're going to revise our specifications. You know, the we have an experimental cesium JS implementation, which is how I made those demos. So we're going to just keep continuing the open source development there. Uh, we want to bring it to other uh, engines, you know, that, such as uh, Unreal and you know O3D. 
uh, you know, we have some sample data, but we want to keep providing more, you know, uh, create some more tooling so it's just easier to get up and running with 3D tiles next. And we want to uh, talk with the uh, Open Geospatial Consortium and Kronos Group to like start talking about the standardization process of these extensions. So uh, if you want to get involved, the uh, three tiles next, uh, you know, the like the link there uh, brings us to the three tiles repo, and that you know there's more information there. Uh, and there's also uh, also yesterday, uh, Patrick, our CEO, had a blog post that kind of gives like the whole you know uh, vision and goes into a little bit more detail. You can read that there. And uh, season Jess, the implementation, the change log pet lists like all the new features there. Uh, so yeah, thanks for letting me present here at uh, Web three D and uh, excited to you know, answer some questions in the panel. Well, thanks, Pierre. I really do appreciate it. Uh, rather than if because of time, let's just go ahead and go into Tam Wright's next uh, his presentation, and then we'll save the questions for both you and him at the back end here. So, Tam Wright, do you want to go ahead and move your stuff, please? Sure. Thank you, John. Um, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. And do you see my screen? Okay. Yes, everything looks good. All right. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> so. Um, this morning, I'll talk a little bit about uh, I3S, uh, Index 3D, um, Index uh, 3D Scene Layer uh, Standard, and how it is enabling uh, 3D GIS to be pervasive uh, everywhere in uh, different platforms, uh, from desktop, web, mobile, how this open standard is uh, trying to uh, become pervasive. Um, now, GIS and 3D is uh, advancing, and we, you know, we have all seen uh, the movement that has been taking on in uh, whether it's uh, creating uh, digital twins or representing uh, geospatial infrastructure or buildings or cityscapes. All that field has, has been evolving in the, in the past decade, but what is new in the last maybe five years is that uh, previously, uh, oftentimes we used to have, you know, very high-end desktop systems. Uh, people used to model these things, but now uh, almost everybody wants to do this on the web all the time. So the web is not just uh, an addition, but it is it has become the primary uh, interface where uh, folks want to do uh, modeling, visualizing, analysis of uh, uh, 3D content, and uh, this capabilities, uh, you know, whether uh, we're talking about uh, being able to, um, uh, you know, model a city, a cityscape or a network uh, using point clouds, uh, meshes, uh, or uh, procedurally modeled or ML and uh, AI generated models. It has all come to the same place now that uh, people expect, you know, integrated experience, uh, the same experience that you have in desktop, the same experience uh, uh, you know, people would like to have the same experience on the web and the mobile. And this is where, you know, standards, uh, open format standard, uh, standards such as I3S and 3D tiles and Next3D and others come into play, uh, where um, a, the content uh, could be generated in a variety of applications and a variety of, uh, you know, uh, softwares. But uh, if it could be shared into an open standard, um, then everybody can consume it, uh, the more the merrier, right? Um, so I3S, uh, Index 3D Scene Layer, uh, was one such format that was shared uh, to the uh, OGC, to the, uh, to the community, actually, uh, in early 2014. And then uh, the OGC, the uh, Open Geospatial Consortium, adopted it as the first community standard in the fall of 2017. So we're very happy that uh, OGC ran away with it. And, uh, you know, as standards go, it's a living, breathing standard. It's been evolving and uh, we are now on the uh, uh, second uh, adoption of the I3S or update of I3S 1.2 with OGC. Um, and uh, ASRI has been maintaining this community standard that the uh, uh, community GitHub version uh, of it uh, down below shown, um, but OGC has been very um, uh, um, has been very instrumental in actually pushing that and making it uh, you know work in uh, all different uh, systems. So what is I3S really? I3S uh, um, has uh, support for you know uh, streaming massive amount of geospatial content. Uh, 
uh, it supports uh, five different types of layers, uh, 3D objects, uh, points in layer, integrated mesh layer, uh, point clouds in layer, and buildings in layer. Um, now, as I said, like, you know, the process with OGC, how we have gone about it is, you know, incrementally updating this uh, format. So the first four layer types are uh, currently supported as an OGC uh, standard. Uh, buildings in layer uh, hopefully will be upcoming soon. Again, the process takes time and uh, community adaption and whatnot uh, needs to be there. So uh, typically uh, we stagger these things uh, over time. Uh, but and with I3S, uh, as I said, uh, with this uh, uh, different layer types, you can model your real world, you know, with uh, three objects uh, being able to be used to model, you know, 3D scapes, 3D cities, and integrated mesh, uh, what we uh, call, you know, skin of the earth, where it has uh, both geometry and texture married into a single uh, entity and being able to be streamed and consumed on the uh, uh, on on client application is also a good way of modeling, you know, uh, real world. Uh, as well as, you know, points symbolized by uh, 3D models, GLTF or any other format that you have um, are also a uh, typical way of uh, representing your 3D world. And then obviously uh, point cloud is also yet another format. So this extensibility, uh, open formatness and extensibility with new layer types and profiles uh, allows the system to be, you know, not antiquated, uh, but uh, still be mature. And, uh, uh, but, you know, you would still be able to add new features without, you know, worrying about breaking compatibility. Um, so in following that, that, that uh, pattern of building sin layer is the new layer type that uh, has been out for a few years, but once the uh, momentum builds in the community, uh, will hopefully be adapted by OGC uh, as well. Um, so um, as we speak right now, actually, um, the OGC uh, is uh, about to publish the I3S 1.2 standard. So this is uh, um, the uh, second uh, adoption, actually the third, because we had I3S 1.0, 1.1, and now 1.2. Uh, the third uh, evolution of the format where uh, we improved uh, uh, better material support for PVR, um, GLTF compatible uh, material support, uh, paging of nodes where we're reducing uh, massively the uh, client server traffic. Uh, this is akin to like having implicit uh, tiles, but uh, the paging, the nodes are now uh, paged into a group of nodes so that the client server architecture would only request uh, uh, you know, a group of nodes as opposed to each tile uh, per se. Um, compactness of geometry, uh, breaker compression uh, is now supported, uh, where the geometry is, uh, even, you know, even more compact than it was before. And um, additionally, uh, one additional feature that I2S 1.2 is going to bring is the ability to support uh, KTX2 or basis compressed texture support. And this significantly reduces the, you know, texture size uh, that used to be uh, shown between uh, client server architecture. Um, so these are some of the uh, updates that are upcoming with I3S 1.2, which is just under adoption with 4GC right now as we speak. Um, so let me just quickly go through some of the experiences uh, that you know users would like to see with uh, you know open formatness and also being able to do it as I said in desktop, mobile, and browser. What are the experiences users uh, like to see? Well. It, it, here is the first experience where, you know, being able to represent, you know, 3D content has this dual nature where, uh, you know, in the past, you know, past maybe, uh, if you rewind 10, 15 years, uh, you know, uh, procedurally modeled or attribute driven uh, representation of uh, cityscapes was the prominent or the major facet that you typically see, but that has now changed, right? With the uh, reality capture and being able to capture the world as it is, that has evolved, but it doesn't mean that, you know, it has been replaced. Uh, 3D features, database-driven views of your city or your landscape is also prominently important. But then at the same time, being able to marry that and uh, merge it with the uh, reality capture content is also key. Um, now, analysis, not only folks would like to just see, visualize, and, you know, hop around the world digitally, but also perform analysis. Uh, would I be able to do, you know, typical uh, line of sight analysis uh, uh, or contours being able to dynamically generate it? These are the experiences, uh, you know, in terrain analysis, for example, is experiences uh, users would like to see in, the, in, in a web application. 
um, scenario. So here you see that, you know, I have scenario A and scenario B, uh, would I be able to, you know, this is very important in, the, in planning, in uh, urban uh, scenario, urban redevelopment analysis, where you'd be able to model uh, say in this case, you know, from vantage point A and scenario B, you know, what are the uh, line of sight visibility, you know. Um, additionally, my favorite one here, how about being able to model, you know, time change, daylight. For example, here, you'd see that, uh, you, you know, in temperate zone areas, it's very important to see how many hours during the day that a, a new proposed building is going to cast a shadow. And you know, getting an analysis of that is is, is an important uh, use case. Uh, yet another use case is uh, the ability to represent from realistic uh, this reality capture model to uh, schematic, uh, where it's driven by attribute. This is city of San Francisco. The same data, the same high risk layer is now being represented, styled in uh, you know reality capture mode, uh, schematic, and then even having fun, uh, sort of like hand drawn. Uh, style or symbolization, uh, artistic, if you will. So being able to do that, have different views on the same data and the same open format that is there is important for users. Um, but that's not only the experience uh, folks would like to see, right? Uh, folks would like to model uh, climate change and disaster response uh, with realism included here, as you see, like, you know, the uh, reflection on the water is there, uh, and uh, the model shows a reality capture or a, uh, of a city escape where uh, people are modeling, you know, 100 year uh, flood models, you know, what would happen if, uh, you know, there was flooding of uh, this label. And then again, mirroring that was attribute or uh, attribute driven information overlaid on top of uh, um, and city captures uh, would, you know, give this added, added, added contextual view into your data. Uh, so these are some of the experiences that uh, users are uh, expecting to see. Uh, the other layer that I mentioned uh, that is supported in I3S and hopefully soon will be adapted as part of OGC as well is uh, buildings in there. So here we're revealing the inside of a building, you know, for come from cityscape, landscapes, and then go into a building and be able to reveal the content of the building itself. And, and not only that, be able to isolate, you know, for example, in this case, it's isolating the stairs. That's what I'm all interested about. And I would be able to measure it, measure the you know, exact specific stairs. This is an experience that, again, JS users are asking for and is available in the uh, context of uh, ESRI uh, products. And also, in, as again, it's supported as, a, as a part of the open format I3S. Um, now, another area that we've been working on with I3S is I3S and deep learning, you know, making I3S uh, AI and deep learning friendly. So um, as you can see here in the upper uh, slides, uh, what, can I use I3S data to be able to say, classify the power lines, uh, you know, um, and be able to get a good result? Yeah, you can get, achieve really good result, but format is structured in such a way that it is very friendly for a uh, book for, for, for using point cloud data for segmentation, or even further for using integrated mesh to be able to automatically segment the data to say if it is a building, a car, or a tree, uh, be able to semantically label that automatically using uh, deep learning models uh, would, be, um, would be a great addition to the format. So again, uh, the format supports it, promotes it, and we're uh, using that also. Um, one area that I would like to mention about, you know, where we're talking about open and open format is uh, leveraging uh, open format, such as GLTF to be like, use it to use it, uh, to, to be able to use it as a, a glue to connect, you know, between different disparate uh, systems. So GLTF um, is supported in uh, I3S and um, is used uh, sort of to maintain consistency, not only on web platforms, but all across. Um, now, you know, there are many different, uh, you know, applications that would generate many different formats, um, and then being able to bring that into a common format, in this case in GLTF, and then also be able to publish it uh, as an I3S content uh, would allow us to interop uh, with uh, various different applications, not only within the ArcGIS ecosystem, but outside also. Um, 
So just a quick example of that is, uh, you know, being able to say, um, connect to some GLTF warehouse, bring it to the application display uh, uh, or model um, uh, an I3S uh, point uh, feature uh, or point scene there uh, symbolized by GLTF is, is uh, uh, very powerful. Uh, keeping the you know uh, the quality and realism that comes with these models is also very engaging for uh, your typical uh, GIS user. So again, we try in the Esri ecosystem of application, we try to support it everywhere. Again, where all these uh, products that you see work with again desktop, uh, mobile, and uh, uh, and uh, browser ecosystems. Um, here is another example of that. Um, uh, an application that shows a citizen engagement or collaboration uh, use case, right? So um, the application is trying to show that you can plant objects here and there, uh, but then also can connect to, you know, uh, a, a GLTF warehouse and uh, plant uh, that object. In this case, the screen is uh, and the trees are GLTF models uh, uh, shown. Another area I trace has been used and is also very effective is uh, uh, you know bringing um, uh, geo geographic data geographic content to game engines and allowing an immersive experience right so uh, as we go into that world into uh, per se the metaverse if you will uh, you know pervasive environments uh, from desktop to uh, XR to uh, uh, mobile. Uh, are becoming more expected and standard. And for that, again, having this common open format that allows you to do that uh, is, 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 is a key feature. Um, actually, turn off the sound here, sorry. Um, so here, an experience that you'd see uh, on the uh, right and left are uh, the ArcGIS Maps SDK that allows you to uh, consume address content within a game engine environment. Uh, now, this actually brings a huge opportunity for uh, Geospatial, where uh, you know uh, it's immersive, it's uh, engaging, it brings a new paradigm and a new experience for users that have uh, maybe not used that kind of uh, a system. So, uh, being able to uh, do that in a virtual system and able to do planning. For example, on the right, you see that uh, using a, a, a head-mounted uh, VR experience, you can do planning where you would say, well, this is the proposed zone. This is where uh, I would like to see you know, city being built and uh, modeling it, uh, reviewing that architecture model within, uh, you know, collaboratively within your colleagues would be just an amazing experience. Um, so these are the experiences that are coming up and being supported by uh, the format and by the uh, uh, by the ecosystem. Um, so the ArcGIS Maps SDK is out now publicly. Anybody can download and uh, beta try it, and uh, it's available for both Unity and Unreal. And uh, again, supports the I3S standard as well. Um, then my last set of few slides uh, would be about the I3S support in open framework. So. Uh, in the past uh, three, four years, we've been working with the open community and trying to make sure that I3S is supported in uh, open formats. One good example of that is uh, Loaders GL. Uh, Loaders GL is uh, a part of this GL framework uh, uh, that allows you to load uh, geospatial content. So not only we were able to work with the community to uh, support I3S within Loaders GL, but also with Dick GL, where you can uh, load the address content in an open format and an open false view. And this uh, work, this experience actually has uh, brought uh, various uh, enriching uh, uh, experience from community that was not you know, exposed to this. And we're very grateful for that and happy that uh, Lotus GL community has actually embarked upon that. So that's one example where I3S is being now used in an open format, open uh, ecosystem. Another one, I'm glad I had Peter here on the call too as well. Uh, I3S, we've been, uh, we've been also working with the community to support I3S and say CZM, being able to uh, uh, visualize an I3S there in the CZM is, is, uh, is uh, really, would be really a great addition. Uh, there's an active PR for it and the CZM repo and is undergoing the uh, review with the team and hopefully soon that will be also become uh, available. Um, but, we didn't stop there. Um, 
one thing that we've noticed is that having an interoperability between I3SN 3D tiles and other formats have been very key ask of the community. And because of that, we've worked again with the Lotus uh, GL community and in uh, uh, providing a converter. Uh, this converter that allows you to transcode between I3S and 3D tiles and 3D tiles to I3S has been very popular and uh, is available to uh, generate content both ways. Um, the, uh, you know, both support uh, for uh, Lotus GL and Dick GL, they are all under uh, open source and under MIT umbrella of licenses. Um, anybody can use this uh, converter or just the uh, Lotus GL and Deck GL community to be able to uh, consume uh, Nitrous content and also generate other formats from within it. Um, in summary, um, what I would say is uh, current trend is pointing for 3D WebJS to become the primary interface for most geospatial users. Um, a good out of the box functionality. Uh, you know, we provide a whole set of uh, functionality from desktop, mobile to web, as well as APIs. But you know, a good chunk of the user base uh, would just appreciate just the uh, you know features, box out of the box functionality, whether it's in force or card solution, and be able to consume it. Uh, you know, without a lot of uh, issue uh, would be a you know a great thing. Um, Geospatial users expect uh, consistency and experience of data and quality between web desktop and mobile experience. And this has been evident uh, that uh, people are not gonna settle for less, uh, whether uh, just because it's running on a mobile or web quality or uh, consistency should not be compromised. Um, but you know, going forward, there are risks, right? Uh, fragmentation of features between various browsers and being able also to have a, 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 um, have a, a content that works across all uh, platforms is also a challenge. Um, with that, I'll uh, wrap up and uh, I'll uh, give it back to John. Uh, but one, if I could be entertained for like one minute, uh, I would like to quickly show uh, the examples of the AI trace that I said are available, uh, being consumed in the open format. So here is one example of I3S uh, 1.7 being consumed in the uh, Lotus GL uh, experience. This is a uh, city of San Francisco uh, with 3D object layer, um, 80,000 plus uh, buildings, and also being able to support, you know, feature identity and feature segmentation. Um, similarly, uh, the CZM experience of what I mentioned, being able to use the i content is also available. Uh, again, where you'd be able to, you know, identify features and be able to select it and also be able to, uh, you know, use uh, various types of uh, uh, i layer supported uh, 3D objects as well as integrated mesh. So uh, at this point, I can uh, uh, give it back to you, John. And, uh, Thank you, Tamara. Well, I, I really do appreciate both your and Peter's presentations. I think uh, you touched on many of the elements that we wanted to focus on today, which were discussions about functionality, functions about consistency, and obviously the issues associated with standardization. So obviously, I, I've been receiving some questions as we come in. And Peter, the first one I'm going to direct to you. How can CZM collaborate with Web3D about open standards and interoperability? Yeah, so uh, you know, CZM is all about uh, open standards and you know work, you know work uh, collaboration. So you know, like we're you know always happy to talk about uh, about this stuff. You know, you know, we're, we always and you know we're we'd like to invite you to you know you know bring any insights, use cases, and stuff. I mean, like all our you know all our open source stuff is on GitHub. You know, three D tiles and CZM. You know, uh, you know we're. And, and and that's part of why we're here at Web three D is you know just to you know talk about the like the open you know the our commitment to open standards and uh, you know because uh, it's super important to you know be able to make things that like you know that can be shared and you know the like make formats that many different applications can work with. And that's a great comment to kind of build upon. I mean, Tamara, you, you know, we're you know inherently in this. In this, in this conference, we've been talking about a variety of different issues, issues associated with, you know, the evolution of the metaverse issues, looking at how geospatial content is going to evolve in a web browser standpoint, and looking at the way we're starting to see things taking place. And obviously, the efforts are going on those you see, the efforts going on with 3D, the story, and the want to create further collaboration. 
How do you think Esprit can work with Web 3D to ensure the same thing, that same interoperability, those same issues about open standards and adaptation of formats such as X3D, as well as the other formats that you know you brought up mm -hmm. in the presentation? No, that's that's good. Um, so we're actually kind of living it right now, right? Uh, interoperability between different formats is key feature. And uh, in fact, uh, when I3S came out uh, in early 2014 or so, we just made sure that uh, it was an open format uh, that uh, folks would be able to consume it in all different application codes or FOSS solution uh, and be able to interchange and exchange content from I3S to other formats. So, uh, that being the case, um, OGC has played a big role in that. Uh, the fact that you know OGC uh, wanted to standardize and uh, make the I3S uh, format uh, an OGC community standard was great, and uh, it was the uh, first one adopted, as I said earlier. Um, and I see uh, patterns like that, where uh, be it you know X3D or any other formats that wants to interrupt with this uh, standards. Uh, the pattern or the uh, the way that I would see forward uh, working with this would be uh, through uh, uh, open format uh, converters, for example. Uh, now, I mentioned the uh, 3D task to I3S converter that we spend a lot of time working with because we saw the need. Uh, folks are going to have content in all different format, uh, but just because they have it in different format, they should not be you know kind of excluded from using it from their choice of application. So how do you really bridge that gap, right? And uh, for us, the way that we've looked at it and what we've been working on was trying to provide this open source, open format uh, uh, solutions. And once it takes off in the community, really uh, that momentum uh, will take it to many places. And uh, I would say the same thing could happen also with X3D, uh, be it with I3S or 3D tiles and being able to interrupt with it uh, and by providing some converters would be uh, a way to go about it. Well, that's a great way of putting it. I mean, I mean, the issue here is, is to find ways that we're looking at, you know, creating, I guess, a, a Chinese menu approach from converter standpoint, where you understand their, their handling values uh, taking and moving from one domain to another and how uh, we're trying to inherently bring as much interoperability as we can to this to this community. From our standpoint, I mean, obviously you all have been both uh, Esri and Cesium have been looking at the market and looking at how the market continues to evolve. From both of your standpoints, where do you think looking at the changes in the market, where are the places that are kind of surprising you where there are interests in the market that you hadn't really considered? Is there a place in the market you've had that you've seen growth that you have really thought that you would see growth in? Peter, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> uh, the... <laughs> if you don't, I mean, it's fine. I'm just trying to yeah. understand. I mean, yeah. here we're talking about converting, we're talking about collaboration. The question I'm trying to understand is, is where there's opportunity see the market and the, and the environment starting to evolve too. I mean, inherently, yeah. the idea here is we can find ways to build on all the applications that you know, both of you presented. I'm just trying to figure out where we think we see Web3D going and how do we end up finding ways to work together to get there. Yeah, and um, I mean, so, some, I guess, <laughs> Sorry, this question just caught me a little bit by surprise. Okay. But yeah. The um, you know, like certainly we see like you know lots of cool technologies being used. I mean, uh, like say uh, for example, like you know, see like lidar and photogrammetry and you know point clouds and stuff used a lot. Uh, you know, for you know as, as one you know use case that's you know seems to be becoming more prevalent. I mean, think about like you know lidar is now like even on our phones and drones and whatnot. You know. And, Good point. You know the you know so like you know and there's plenty of other you know formats of data and you know making these available to you know hey I can like scan something on the phone and then you know pop it into uh, Cesium well, or Arc ArcGIS or something. You know. Well, and that's a question. I, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, inherently the applications are becoming a lot more user friendly. We're able to output 
you know, people are able to sit out there with their iPhone 13 Pro and sit there and start scanning objects right. and like they haven't inherently before. Where we're inherently people are going to want to find what they can capture that information into these environments. And I, I'm assuming you all are, are considering those challenges and how right. to bring that data to bear quickly and more efficiently and a standard using standards that you know are, are internationally recognized. One one additional point that I might like to add is I, I see actually uh, even bigger opportunities going forward. And we've talked about the metaverse and whatnot, um, where the challenge, you know, when we are all coming with all these different formats, different standards, and uh, opportunities that I see is that, uh, for example, in the areas of metadata uh, is one thing that uh, Peter touched upon as well. And um, uh, I3S also has a robust support for metadata. Um, but um, one thing that we could all work together in making sure uh, semantics um, that we're talking, you know, we could be talking about the same thing, but calling it differently. And that could pose a lot of challenge. Uh, and typically uh, organizations uh, such as uh, Web3D and Chromos and OGC, where they could really help is, um, you know, saving that um, or having a platform where, uh, you know, those things are succinctly described and uh, are labeled and the community can use it uh, similarly because uh, uh, the worst thing that could happen would be like, you know, having the same thing being called differently because of different uh, products, vendors and whatnot and not being able to interop, uh, whether it's in the metaverse or, uh, or in different applications that you are trying to use it. Um, so those are opportunities that I see coming together and working together and making sure that we're you know, uh, uh, communicating or labeling things similarly, at least having the same kind of nomenclature uh, would help a lot. Yeah, and- uh, Go ahead, Go ahead here. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the um, yeah, I, you know, what time time said definitely is uh, you know important to us too. Is uh, you know the you know me, uh, especially with you know the open metaverse and you know trying to build this interoperability and you know yes we have you know our, our metadata and schemas and stuff and we have the intent of like you know we have these semantics in you know say in three tiles or whatever. But yes, it, like there's another level above that that you need to have is like you need to be able to have. You know, uh, conversations, but you know, like between you know players in different industries, to be able to say like, hey, what is you know, what properties do we act? What is actually meaningful? What what can we all use? And like you know, and, and standards groups, you know, the OGC and, um, and Chronos and Web three D, like certainly like you know, uh, those kind of conversations are important to uh, with them to you know make this happen to you know, because like you know, you, like you know, in order to have it interact. Uh, Interoperability like requires you know discussion from everyone. So, well, and, and that's you know the, the value proposition as Nicholas ended up indicating when we started this uh, workshop was you know the thing was is that we came away with SIGGRAPH with a clear understanding that things were really evolving quickly for all of us. We were all trying to adapt to a, an environment that continues to change, where uh, you know the the, the the power of the data and the power of the visualization are. are Day to day, uh, at different levels of uh, of our culture, and from our standpoint, you know, the, the need here is, I think, we both have touched on, Sam touched on a really good point with regards to the need to come, you know, for the community to come together and come to uh, create a foundation that we're all working from the same kind of, uh, you know, kind of construct and framework. I think it's important that we're able to do that. I think we're also realizing that we, if we're all going to succeed. Got to create mechanisms that converters and other uh, tools have allow us to create greater interoperability between our different approaches to these type of issues, uh, just to um, in, in, you know to create further engagement and communication forward as a whole. So I mean, if, if we can begin building on those type of things, I, I think that would be extremely exciting. I, I don't want to eat up. We got just a couple more minutes. Does anybody else have any questions? Nicholas, Peter, both of you are on the session. Watch here. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, so both Peter and Nicholas are both quiet, so I'm going to assume we're all set. Um, thank you all for your time today. We've got the top of the hour. I do appreciate this discussion. I look forward to building on it going forward. Um, thank you all for making the time, and uh, hey, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Well,